Hello, and welcome to today's discussion. My name is Destiny Dean, and I am a sophomore here at the John Jay College, major in Deviance, Crime, and Cultural Studies. I am an active volunteer in our Women's Center for Ginger Justice, and I'm, I'm excited to be here today to introduce our program titled In the Aftermath of Roles Reversal, Examining the Threat of Criminalization of Reproductive Healthcare. On June 24th, 2022, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, the landmark 1973 Supreme Court decision that made access to abortion a federal right in the United States. The decision dismantled 50 years of legal protection and paved the way for individual states to limit or just outright ban abortion. Our panel of experts will help us understand how the legal landscape related to abortion rights has shifted dramatically since Roe's reversal particularly how the criminal justice system is being weaponized to prevent access to reproductive health care. Let's begin our discussion. Please welcome our esteemed facilitator, Acting Executive Director of Pregnancy Justice, Dana Susman. Hi there. Thank you so much, Destiny. Um, we have a lot to talk about, and we only have about an hour to do it. So um, I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists. Um, and then get right into our conversation. Um, and unfortunately, Assembly Member um, Jessica Gonzalez Rojas is in the middle of budget negotiations in Albany and um, was called into a conference meeting at the last minute and likely won't be able to join us, although she may um, pop in if she can. Um, that is just how things go in Albany these days. Budget negotiations have stretched much longer than I think we expected, um, but we know she's fighting for all the right things and we're, we're glad she's there doing it. Um, and I will, uh, I will though, uh, sort of mention her very briefly because she is a remarkable uh, advocate in this, in this space. Um, Jessica Gonzalez Rojas is a state assembly member for the 34th assembly district in New York. Um, before she uh, became an elected official, she spent 13 years leading the Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice um, and made the transition to public service uh, several years ago. Uh, Lisa Landau is another one of our panelists today. She served as um, she currently serves as the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's General Counsel in New York City um, and has been doing so since November 2020. Um, she has a long and storied career working to advance maternal, reproductive, and family health in, in within government and outside of government. Um, it would take me many, many minutes to describe all that she's accomplished, um, but I think we'll be popping um, their longer bios in the in the chat. And David Cohen is a professor of law at Drexel University's Klein School of Law, where he teaches constitutional law, reproductive rights and justice, and sex discrimination in the law. Um, he's the author of two books, co-author of two books, and many scholarly articles on abortion, and represents Pennsylvania's um, ab independent abortion providers in various legal matters. I highly recommend you follow him on Twitter, which is where I often get the, my most uh, clear legal interpretation of what's happening. Um, so I highly recommend you follow him there. Um, so um, I'm going to kick us kick this off with uh, the opportunity for each of the speakers to the panelists, Lisa and David, to um, take a little bit of time, about five minutes to answer these questions. Um, so we really have a grounding in what's going on right now. Um, I know that's certainly not enough time, but um, first, uh, Professor Cohen, if you could, in that short amount of time, describe um, the consequences of the reversal of Roe, um, you know, that happened almost a year ago, what has happened since then and where, what is the current landscape right now? Absolutely, thank you so much, Dana, and everyone else who was involved in organizing this. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk about these things, even though they are depressing and um, we wish the world were a better place right now, but it's important to understand what's going on. So, um, although it looks like the assembly member is joining right now, so I don't know if you wanna welcome her and <laughs> then get back, or maybe we'll see if she joins, but, um, so, um, so where we are right now, so after the Dobbs decision, um, states were free to do what they want with respect to abortion. And we now have 14 states where abortion is illegal um, throughout pregnancy. 
Um, and then another five states where there's some kind of limit. So Georgia has a six week ban on abortion, Florida and Arizona, 15 weeks, Utah, 18 weeks and North Carolina, 21 weeks. Um, so these are before viability bans. Um, the states are really concentrated in particular parts of the country where there are these serious restrictions. We've got the Midwest and the South. Um, not exclusively, but that part of the country, we see a real decline in access. And um, the people who live in that part of the country are faced with three options um, in the face of a ban on abortion. They're faced with the options of traveling to a state where abortion remains legal. Um, and travel is something that for some people is really easy. And you can get in the car or get on a plane and travel. But for a lot of people, it's not. A lot of people travel requires privilege. It requires money. It requires being able to take time off from work. It requires support people because you need people who can watch the kids that you have or help you with travel because travel can be difficult for you. It requires a functioning car, it requires gas in the car, it requires food not in your home, it requires lack of fear for being pulled over because of your race or because of your identity, um, not being fearful of immigration status concerns with immigration checkpoints. So travel is not easy for everyone, in fact, far from it. Um, but travel is one option to a state where abortion remains legal. The second option is to get some form of abortion care outside of the legal medical system. And so there are a lot of ways people can self-manage or deal with an abor abortion provider who's not in the United States to get abortion pills um, online um, or through a provider elsewhere. And a lot of people are doing that. And then third, carry a pregnancy to term. Um, and so those really are the three options for people who are in the states that I was just talking about. Um, the best data that we have about what's happening uh, in terms of numbers comes from a study that was released just a few weeks ago called We Count. Um, and it's from the Society of Family Planning. And they estimate that 32,000 people in the first six months after Dobbs were not able to get an abortion who were would have otherwise had an abortion. You know, multiply by two over the course of a year, we're talking about 60 to 70,000 people who are carrying pregnancies to term um, that otherwise would not if Roe had not been overturned. Um, and we'll talk more about what that means for those people um, as we go on, but that's sort of the 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 you know basics of what's happened since. And we'll also talk more about what other states have done who have not banned abortion, but that's sort of the immediate fall of Roe is what that's what's happened with the states that have banned abortion. And sort of a similar question, perhaps for Lisa, from the New York City local government perspective and the um, the public health agency perspective, what is New York City doing um, to mitigate the public health and safety impacts of reversing Roe? Uh, thank you for the question and uh, just delighted to be with all of you uh, kindred spirits. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting perspective for, for myself. I've been at the uh, Department of Health now for two and a half years as general counsel. And, you know, we're the biggest and I'd say the best public health agency in the country um, with a lot of resources and um, energy to do what is needed. Uh, obviously, this followed sort of a huge operation, um, you know, post COVID. And, you know, once Dobbs came down and because the decision had been leaked, as folks probably remember, you know, we were already engaged in thinking about what we could do. What is our best, uh, really, what's our best self for moving forward to address um, really access issues for other parts of the country? So um, we thought long and hard about our best role. And you know, decided for the first time to provide abortion at the city health department. We felt that 
uh, because of what David's mentioning, of course, you know, states just dropping like dominoes um, in, in, in terms of uh, preventing abortion access, you know, restricting abortion access and believing that in the New York City, we would need more access. And so our reproductive health clinics that are across the, the city um, were meant to be, you know, as part of our plan to, to be part of the expansion of abortion. And in this instance, it would be medical abortion um, at our clinics. And that was to be paired with and has been paired with at this point, um, an incredible uh, resource called the New York City Abortion Access Hub. And I'll, I'll put the phone number in, in the chat in a moment. And that hub is meant to pr you know, provide connection to any person that calls on that line to a, a, an appointment in New York City, to insurance, to um, resources, um, to travel. So David talked about you know, travel and costs of traveling. This, this hub is meant to connect um, people who are seeking abortion care with everything they need to actually access that care. And so the line was open back in uh, November. Uh, the medical abortion service has been open since January. And this was really our belief that this was the, uh, the role that we could take in New York City to actualize um, lifting up people from other states, if they want so desire to come to New York as this sanctuary really for, um, for accessing abortion care and as accessing that basic health care. That's, that was the, the thing that we felt that we could do best. Of course, some of the other things, you know, advocating for, for, you know, legislation, doing other kinds of um, work with the state. Um, but, but, for me um, and for the health department is interesting, we've turned into providers and, you know, all that that entails. And, you know, I think we can certainly as lawyers appreciate and I certainly appreciate, um, you know, just how much that that actually entails to, to operationalize these these, you know, a, a, a hub of information providing and connection to abortions in New York City and also um, Ha actually providing medical abortion in our clinics. Um, thanks so much, Lisa. And I, before I, I turn back to David, I want to just for the, because I know we have a lot of students who will be, who are watching or who will be watching this to just be very clear around what people's rights are in New York City and in New York State, particularly surrounding the flurry of activity around um, the decisions coming out of the Supreme Court and the lower court um, in Texas around medication abortion. So um, if you could just um, share again, sort of what is the state of affairs right now and how that impacts New York City? I guess I would just jump in, you know, being the New York City person to say that we are uh, well protected in New York, in New York State and in New York City. Um, you know, the, the right to abortion is constitutionally protected in New York, and it's also um, now very clearly protected through the uh, passage of the Reproductive Health Act in 2019. It took a while for New York to actually pass that law, but that law um, puts the right to abortion in the right place in the public health law and took it out of the sort of exception, you know, for homicide, which it, it actually, where it stood actually all those years. Um, but in New York, we are, um, I would say, a, a, an island of, um, of, of protection of that, of that right in both statutorily and constitutionally. And so, um, you know, we, we, we are aligned with other similar states. There are certainly other states like us, but, you know, it's, it's really feeling the import of our role at this moment with so many states uh, banning abortion. So just to say that part of what we've done, you know, in addition to providing this hub is to actually advertise in other states to let uh, pregnant people know that New York is uh, is ready for them if, if they choose to come here. So it's just to, to say we're trying to amplify the message across the states to welcome uh, people in, into New York and connect them with the services and the, 
the financial supports that they need. Great, thank you. And I'll turn it back to David on the point around medication abortion. If you could um, sort of walk us through um, what has happened over the past couple of weeks and what you might predict for, if, if you're in the in the game of, of making predictions, um, what you might predict with respect to access to medication abortion, because I think the scary part about this is, you know, um, even if you, you know, I think some of us who live in blue states or live in New York, we feel like we we're, we're good no matter what, but it may be the case that some of these decisions will have national impact. And I think we should also I unfortunately get out of the mindset that if we're in a blue state, we're, we're good no matter what, because this will impact all of us, whether it's other people who need to travel to, to New York or to where we live to access care and, you know, making sure that there's enough resources for everyone. So if you could speak a little bit to sort of what's happened over the last couple of weeks around medication abortion and, and perhaps what, what you think is, is coming down the pike. Yeah, it's a cra it's been a crazy few weeks. But at the end of the day, nothing has changed. Nothing, nothing changed at all in the past few weeks and nothing has changed yet. And it's probably going to be another year and a half before even anything possibly changes with respect to medication abortion. So it's been all over the news, but the bottom line is that the same thing it's as before. Okay, so what's been going on? Medication abortion, for those who don't know the specifics, involves two different pills. Um, mifepristone or two different drugs, mifepristone and then misoprostol. Um, and they are taken in that order. First, mifepristone starts the abortion and then misoprostol finishes the process. Um, and they were approved 23 years ago by the FDA as safe and effective. Um, and they have become the majority of abortions in the country. Um, and it's been a very quick change, especially in the past five to 10 years. And we are now, and the estimate is from two, uh, two or three years ago that 53% of abortions in this country are using a medication abortion. Um, I'm sure that number is much higher now than it was, but that's the most recent data we have. Um, and so the, the anti-abortion movement understands what just how much of a threat to their end goal, which is banning all abortion, that medication abortion poses. Because medication pills are hard to stop. Um, you can look at what's happened around illegal drugs and you can say, yes, a lot of people have been put in jail because of illegal drugs. A lot of people's lives have been ruined through the criminal justice system. But at the end of the day, illegal drugs are there for anyone who wants them. Um, and people are still getting all sorts of drugs illegally, despite 50 plus years of the war on drugs. It has been ineffective in doing anything other than putting people in jail, black and brown people in jail. Um, the people who want the drugs are still getting. And so if we've learned anything from that history, it's that when you're trying to stop pills, you just can't. And the anti-abortion movement knows that, and they know how much of a threat abortion pills are. So they're trying some creative ways to try and stop abortion pills. Um, it's already illegal to have abortions in the states that I just that we talked about already, um, but they know people there are getting the pills because they can get them in the mail, they can have a friend drive to one state and then drive them back, they can bring them back. There's all sorts of ways to get them. So one of the tactics that they have tried is that they filed an unprecedented lawsuit in Texas back in November claiming that the FDA improperly approved these drugs back in 2000. And they're really actually only targeting the first drug, mifepristone. And they said that that drug was unlawfully approved 23 years ago. And that this federal judge in Texas, who was, it was a, it was a unique filing where they filed in a place where they could get just this one particular judge, this guy, Judge Kaczmarek, and he is anti-abortion through and through, and they knew they would get him if they filed the case there. Um, and so they were asking him to second guess the FDA's approval process and say that this drug actually, even though it's been used for two decades in a safe and effective manner, um, this drug is actually not safe. And 
they got their wish from this judge. The judge held a hearing in uh, March. And then on Good Friday, uh, about three weeks ago, he ruled that the FDA improperly approved this drug because actually, according to him, he's not a scientist, he's not a medical expert, but on his quick review of the FDA's detailed review, he thinks this drug isn't safe. Um, and he thinks that um, the FDA unlawfully approved it. Um, now he said, my decision will take seven days to go into effect. And in that seven day period, the FDA appealed it to the appeals court and they sort of changed things around, um, but they were going to allow that decision to go into effect. But then the Supreme Court stepped in and the Supreme Court stepped in and initially said, um, we're going to pause this for five days. And then they said, we're actually on Friday night, they said, we are going to put this on hold at least until the case comes back to us. So right now, the initial order from Judge Kaczmarek is on appeal to the Texas Federal Appeals Court. They are going to hear the case in May and then make their decision. They are probably more conservative than the US Supreme Court. This is probably the most conservative appeals court in the country. Um, but no matter what they say, because of the Supreme Court um, stay on Friday, it will not go into effect until there's an appeal to the US Supreme Court. And then the US Supreme Court will probably take this case and decide it next year. So what we're looking at is that medication abortion has not changed anywhere in the country. And it'll probably be another year and a half if anything does change and hopefully it won't. But to Dana's sort of the part of Dana's question was part of this strategy is that the anti-abortion movement is trying to get rid of mifepristone because that will affect not only the states that have banned abortion, but it will make it much harder to get a medication abortion in states like New York and where I am, Pennsylvania, where abortion remains legal. Because if the FDA withdraws approval of this drug, it's for everywhere. And everywhere would be affected by this uh, lack uh, withdrawal of approval. Um, and so that's really sort of part of their tactic is that they're trying to um, get rid of abortion as in as many places as they can, even in places where there's supportive legislatures, supportive government, supportive people, um, they want to try and impact that. Um, thank you for that concise uh, sort of walk through the past couple of weeks. Um, can you confirm that ac accessing medication abortion is currently legal in all 50 states? Um, or is there some nuance to that that we should be aware of? Okay, so um, in states where there's abortion bans, it's illegal to, have an, to uh, perform an abortion or provide an abortion, um, no matter what kind of abortion it is. Um, Subject to the exceptions, you know, every state has an exception for when someone's life is at risk, and then some have other exceptions too. Those exceptions are really difficult to use, and you see a lot of doctors just refusing to say that someone's life is at risk, even when their life is at risk. Um, so abortion is banned in all of those states, and that includes medication abortion. Now, only South Carolina, Nevada, and Oklahoma. I believe, and Dana, you might be able to correct me if I'm missing a state or I got one of those wrong, um, criminalizes someone for self-managing their own abortion. So if someone obtains abortion pills on their own and uses them on their own, um, only in those states are they are is that person violating the law, as opposed to getting it from a provider or someone else um, and the state criminalizing the person who gives the person the pills. Um, so if someone, and so one of the places people can go to find out how to get pills, even in a state where it's illegal, is Plan C. Plan C has a list of lots of different ways for people to get pills. It's a website. Um, one of those ways is Aid Access. Aid Access is an international organization, and they will mail pills from India into states where there's an abortion ban. 
So technically the people mailing the pills are violating the law, but unless you're in one of the three states I just mentioned, the person receiving the pills and then using them is not violating the law themselves. Thank you. And yes, those are the states, although I that you mentioned that explicitly criminalize self-managed abortions, but I have I do have a question around Oklahoma. I it's my understanding that law may have been repealed. Um, but um very so the the you know the takeaway is that there's only a, a small number of states that have explicitly criminalized self-managed abortion um, and everywhere else it has it is not explicitly criminalized, um, which I think is important for folks to, to know. Um, and some really great resources that we might be able to compile and circulate later um, that David has mentioned. And I know that Lisa has also put in the New York City abortion access hub information in the chat for folks to take away. And another note I'll just add um, you can always you can also get medication abortion pills in advance. Um, there there is some delay in getting um, pills from from um, pharmacies out of the country. It takes a little bit longer, and there is a, a demand. So we we wouldn't necessarily recommend you know getting a, a lot of of pills in advance, but having medication abortion pills available. Um, for yourself or in your community is it could be a useful thing if you are not in a place where it's readily available, um, which is, you know, not necessarily for New York City where it is available and, and easily accessible. Um, this was a question that we were hoping Assemblymember Gonzalez Rojas would, would answer, but I'm gonna, going to see perhaps if Lisa, you might be able to jump in, um, particularly given your um, your platform at an agency um, that focuses on public health, um, which is the ways in which access to abortion has um, disproportionately impacted communities of color, both before the Dobbs decision and now after the Dobbs decision. Oh yeah, of course. And, and um, anyone who's been involved in, in advocacy on, on reproductive health, you know, knows full well that the inequities of the, of any kind of restriction falls hardest on uh, marginalized people and people of color, uh, it, you know, it has its, its biggest impact. And David mentioned, of course, you know, the costs of travel and daycare and all kinds of things that um, are born you know, by people of color um, and other folks who, who don't have the resources. So, you know, um, I think, you know, we're anticipating, I think I saw a question in the chat too about this, or I'm sorry, in advance that the, the question about, um, you know, black uh, black women uh, being certainly far greater greater at risk for maternal death, maternal mortality. I mean, it's all sort of bound up these numbers. Kind of uh, the the fewer people who have access to the abortion services that they need are going to be disturbed in in any number of ways. Certainly, there's going to be fewer people able to access abortion that they need because it's medically indicated or they uh, have pre-existing conditions that also fall much harder on um, people of people of color. And, um, and all of this then gets sort of uh, tell us, you know, expanded, I would say, you know, when when we're talking about a loss of, of a basic right like this. So the impact is we believe both on the sort of maternal mortality front because more women are going to be or pregnant people are not are, are not going to be able to access the right that they had had previously and it's going to create you know larger numbers. David mentioned um, you know a recent sixty to seventy thousand people carrying to term who hadn't who 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 would have um, terminated their pregnancies and of that there is a large number I'm sure of of uh, people of color who are not going to be able to um, access or hadn't been accessing. And so there are going to be higher numbers of uh, maternal deaths. And, uh, you know, the impact is going to be felt on, on, on populations of color uh, far more than other populations, I would say. So the other thing I just wanted to mention, just, um, you know, just in, in discussing, you know, the, the, the fact that New York is a very protected place, but acknowledging that a case like the FDA case um, 
would have effect nationally, including New York. And just to say that in that span of this past three weeks, as a provider, as a new provider, which I've never been before, but I am now, um, the tumult that it create it, and it has created in you know across the country of um, providers who had been providing both you know maybe solely medical abortion. Um, like our clinics, you know, we have to retrain, think about misoprostol. We, you know, we're trying to just make sure that we are going to be serving uh, people who are seeking uh, abortion. And then, you know, other, other entities that both have um, medical abortion and surgical abortion also having to completely recalibrate. Um, so just, I just wanted to kind of follow up on that theme um, that we were talking about before. And, and it's certainly good that now we have this stay. Um, I'm not so certain that it's, you know, a year and a half, we can, we can fight about the, the exact numbers of, you know, months. It doesn't quite feel like that yet, but, um, you know, I, I think certainly we, we do have a stay and it is, you know, at this moment, same as it was, and we can anticipate it, it will be, um, you know, it will be uh, before the Supreme Court and the stay will be in place until until the Supreme Court decides. So thanks. So a bit of a we can all take a, a, a bit of a breath around medication abortion for now. Um, David, I'm going to turn back to you. Um, and again, the assembly members uh, is, is coming in and out of meetings. So it, um, if she is able to, we'll have her jump in on this. But um, would love for you to talk a little bit about what um, progressive states are doing to shore up protections for reproductive rights um, and sort of what creative approaches different states are taking and whether they're, even if there's anything happening in this legislative session um, or that you predict might, might be coming um, either to New York or where uh, students might be interested in learning more. Yeah, there's a few different things that progressive states have been doing, um, and, and I'll, I'll go through them. One basic one is that a, a bunch of progressive states still had abortion restrictions on the books. Um, and I think that Dobbs and the threat of Dobbs really um, inspired them to take a look at what restrictions they had and consider and then get rid of them. So for instance, uh, Connecticut, your neighbor had a restriction that said only doctors can perform abortions, even though it's perfectly within the standard of care for nurse practitioners um, and certified midwives and physician's assistants to provide medication abortion and even some procedural first trimester abortions. Um, so that advocates had been trying to get that um, changed for years. And I think because of Dobbs, the Connecticut legislature actually changed that and now expanded who can perform abortions in Connecticut. Illinois had a minors uh, had to talk to their parents requirement and they got rid of that. So a bunch of states have been looking at what was still on the books that shouldn't be if we want to really have access to abortion for everyone and they've gotten rid of those. Other states have said we need to send we need to fund abortion some way. And so we've seen Maryland fund training for abortion providers. We've seen Oregon fund uh, abortion providers and travel into Oregon. And California, with a massive amount, I believe it was about $200 million that was spent uh, put aside to help abortion providers, travelers, information provision, et cetera. Um, and these are really uh, important things because frankly, um, without money, a lot of the things we're talking about isn't possible. Um, so that's another part. And then third, we've seen a bunch of states enact what are called shield laws. Connecticut was the first. New York followed on soon after um, last summer. Um, and just this morning, Minnesota became the 12th state to pass a shield law and sign it into law. Or I think it's 11th and Washington state will be 12th uh, later this week because that's passed. What these shield laws do is they say that anyone providing abortions, helping with abortions, or even obtaining an abortion in our state is protected from out-of-state interference, from another state trying to uh, subpoena the records or extradite a provider, because the fear is that, say, someone from Alabama travels to New York to get an abortion and they go back home to Alabama, that a family member or a politician or a prosecutor will be upset 
that they got an abortion in New York. And now they'll try to sue the New York abortion provider or even try to prosecute the New York abortion provider or at least investigate the New York abortion provider or helper or funder. New York and these states with the shield laws have said, we are not going to participate in any of that. We are not going to use our courts to force people to testify. We are not going to use our law enforcement to help with the investigations. Our licensing bodies are not going to discipline any of our providers. We are not going to extradite someone who never stepped foot in those other states. Um, they're basically saying we are protecting the people in our state who are providing lawful care to people no matter if they've traveled from somewhere else. So they are shielding them from those out-of-state consequences. Um, now there's a wrinkle to these laws, and this is one of the things that is currently pending in the New York legislature right now. Um, and uh, the wrinkle is that Massachusetts, Colorado, and Washington, I believe, um, have said we are not only protecting our providers um, when they provide care to someone who travels to our state, so physically travels into the state, we are also going to protect our providers when they provide telehealth from our state, so the providers in Massachusetts, telehealth abortion care to someone who is in a state where abortion is banned. And so that is legally tricky because what the person is doing, what the provider is doing is illegal in that state where the patient is. And there's nothing a state can do to change that, right? So if they're providing telehealth into Alabama, Alabama can make that illegal, Massachusetts can't change that. But Massachusetts can make it so that Massachusetts doesn't see what that provider is doing as, as illegal and will protect them if Alabama comes after them. And so that's a way to help providers access people in states where abortion is illegal. There is a bill currently pending in the New York legislature to expand the New York shield law to include this. Um, I just got information about it while I, we were sitting here on this call. Um, and uh, that the bill in New York has passed through the Senate and it is stalled in the assembly, probably because of budget negotiations. Hopefully it will move through the assembly as soon as the budget negotiations are over, but there has been some controversy about this bill and you can read, there's been some articles in the New York Times about this proposal, um, And uh, but I think it will ultimately pass because I think there are enough people in New York who support this. Um, and the hope is that this will at least provide some protection for some providers who are willing to use telehealth to care for and then mail pills to people in states where abortion is illegal. Thank you. I um I had I you know in asking you that question I didn't even remember the fact that we have a bill in New York that could expand our uh, New York Shield law. So thank you for for raising that up. It's something that we at Pregnancy Justice are supporting as well despite some, you know, challenges around around it. We think it's important. Um, I would like to, to ask you, David, to speak more directly to the issue of criminalization. We've touched on it a bit with respect to providers, um, but I think um, it warrants further discussion. I think there's a, been, a, you know, from where, from my organization, we work at the intersection of criminal um, legal issues and reproductive justice. So we have seen the criminalization of pregnancy um, before the Dobbs decision. We're seeing it now. And if you could speak to the ways in which, what the role of law enforcement is in enforcing abortion bans and sort of the perhaps broader implications that abortion bans or the sort of ideology that supports abortion bans um, how that impacts the, the role, uh, you know, criminalization more broadly and how law enforcement is essentially tasked with enforcing restrictions on abortion. Since Roe was overturned, to the best of my knowledge, we've seen only a small number of prosecutions of people for uh, abortion related crimes. And the ones that we know about, or at least that I know about, Nebraska, South Carolina in particular, 
Um, it, it involves someone obtaining abortion pills before Roe was overturned. Um, and so we don't have sort of a wave of prosecutions post Roe, I think mainly because we don't have people in the states where abortion is illegal performing abortions. Before Roe v. Wade, um, there were a lot of abortion providers, doctors and non-doctors, who were performing abortions all over the country, and they were being prosecuted, although not in high numbers. We don't have doctors or other medical care professionals who are openly um, violating the state abortion laws. Um, so that type of criminalization we haven't seen yet, but we have seen criminalization of people who are obtaining pills or other forms of abortion care on their own or through other means. Um, and that's been consistent for the past couple decades. We have seen, um, you know, if when how has data about over 60 prosecutions in the past couple decades of people who are self-managing their abortions, if you broaden the scope, you have hundreds of prosecutions of people for pregnancy outcomes um, that a prosecutor decides this stillbirth looks like you did something wrong, so we're gonna prosecute you um, or something of that nature. Um, and the, um, the, the theme here is a couple different things. One, of course, since now we're talking about the criminal justice system, Black and brown people are disproportionately targeted for pregnancy criminalization crimes, whether it's an abortion crime or something else, endangering the uh, welfare of a minor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and two, it shows that the criminal justice system can be used and often is used by people to police the way people are pregnant and say, there's a good way to be pregnant and there's a bad way to be pregnant. And getting an abortion, that's a bad way to be pregnant. Using drugs, that's a bad way to be pregnant. Not getting the right prenatal care, drinking alcohol, you can go on and on. And for some people, um, medical health professionals look at people who are not doing what they might see as an optimal things during pregnancy and say, we need to provide counseling and better care and prenatal care, and that's the right way to do it. But the criminal justice system is a blunt tool. And those who think the criminal ju justice system is the right way to approach these things says, what are we going to do? We're going to prosecute people. We're going to prosecute people for actions taken during pregnancy. And um, it's not a coincidence that one of the states I mentioned for the abortion prosecutions is South Carolina. South Carolina has a long history of prosecuting people for actions taken during pregnancy. Um, and was one of the first states where the state Supreme Court said that you can prosecute someone for drug use during pregnancy. Um, and Alabama and Tennessee and South Carolina are the three states that have really led the way, not exclusively, but those three states in particular have led the way. And I think overturning Dobbs with this sort of the Supreme Court giving its blessing to states using their criminal justice system to um, basically tell people the right way to be pregnant is going to pave the way for more and more policing of pregnancy, not just around abortion, but around all sorts of other issues related to pregnancy outcomes. Um, and we know who's going to bear the brunt of that. Thank you so much for that. Um, it is uh, very, it, often when we talk about these things, it is very scary. And it is very dark, but I do think that it's important to recognize that, um, unfortunately, the reality is, as you described, these kinds of prosecutions were happening even before Dobbs. And the, uh, the few that we've seen post-Dobbs actually involve pre-Dobbs conduct. So people who got pills um, and took them either later in pregnancy than is permissible or um, got them in a way that wasn't sanctioned by the law in the state. Um, and, uh, but but certainly the threat exists and it is a very scary and uncertain um, dynamic right now. Um, I, we do have a couple questions in the chat and so I'm gonna offer them to either Lisa or David. Um, the first is how much of a threat are um, anti-abortion activists uh, posing to birth control? Sort of where does birth control sit in the crosshairs here? Um, and do we, can we make any sort of predictions as to where we're headed? 
I'll start with that. The the Supreme Court's decision um, overturning Roe relied on, or sorry, is connected to birth control in a very particular way, which is that the, the basis of protection of abortion in Roe v. Wade is the same basis of the protection for the right to access a, a birth control. It's under this idea of privacy and that the state can't interfere with private matters. Um, and so the Supreme Court said in its main opinion from Justice Alito that we are only talking about overturning abortion rights. Um, but it really didn't provide any assurance other than just stating it, that you can't use the same logic to overturn Roe v. Wade to also overturn protections for contraception. And Justice Thomas, who was part of the majority, wrote a separate opinion where he was actually honest about it. He, you know, unlike the majority, which said this is only about abortion, Justice Thomas said, no, we're coming for birth control too, um, because that's just as ungrounded in anything as he sees as right under the Constitution. So there's a very open threat to birth control protection there. Um, and we're seeing um, on the ground, we haven't seen a case directly attacking birth control generally, um, but what we've seen are many attempts to get religious exemptions to the provision of birth control, um, not just um, uh, you know, all sorts of birth control. So the anti-abortion movement and those anti-birth control movement think some think all birth control should be religiously exempt. And we've seen those kind of attempts to say that if you're a religious entity, you don't have to provide it to your employers or your patients. Um, and we've seen courts generally be, willing to agree. And then a very serious attack is being launched in Texas um, to the Title X program, which is federally funded uh, health centers that for decades have been providing birth control to minors without parental knowledge or consent. Because a minor wanting birth control, having to ask their parent first, is not a good way to make sure the minor gets the birth control that they're seeking. Um, and so Title X has been doing that for decades. And it's really been a huge success story in terms of access to birth control um, for minors. Some parents sued in Texas saying it violates our parental rights to have Title X clinics dispensing birth control without our knowing. And a federal judge in Texas, I believe the same judge that was in the Mifepristone case, said that it does violate parental rights. And based on that ruling, now minors in Texas cannot obtain birth control through Title X programs without their parents knowing. Um, and that decision is cabined so far just to Texas. But if that were to be broadened, um, that would be a real threat for minors' access to birth control. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going for time. I'm going to consolidate the next two questions in the chat, um, which speak to um, the the sorry the various bans around the country and the gestational limits of those bans. I know you touched on that, David, earlier. Um, it the Every state has a different regime in place. Some have bans that are as early as six weeks. Some have bans that are, I think the latest one was 21 weeks that you mentioned, David. Um, uh, some put it at viability. So it does vary state to state. Um, and they are ever changing because um, there are legal challenges that are being brought by abortion providers and organizations under the state constitution of some of those states um, to block some restrictions um, and new laws are being passed. So it is um, it is a, a, a week to week um, shifting landscape. Um, and then the next question is around exceptions. Um, so uh, there are some exceptions, as David mentioned, in different laws, whether it's the health of the pregnant person or life of the pregnant person or rape or incest, which are really, as David mentioned, really um, unavailable or inaccessible in many ways um, to people who are trying to navigate those exceptions. And it also makes care really hard to access when you've got a ban in your state and then, you know, might have to jump through some loopholes in order to get, um, in order to access care. Um, so I just wanted to answer those real quick. 
Um, I'm going to turn it over to Ruby um, to ask some questions of our panelists now, if she's there. Hi, um, I'm Ruby. Um, I'm a student in the um, Law and Society major at John Jay. Um, and I had a question for the panelists. Um, I've seen in the news that Roe v. Wade was ultimately about the fundamental right to privacy um, and its reversal could open the door for challenges to other cases. Could we potentially see challenges to things like um, same-sex relationships, same-sex marriage, um, like other protected rights um, that are um, currently protected? I mean, I, I think, you know, David's been looking at these issues more, more closely than I have, but I think um, most of us who are involved in reproductive health and know the case law is, as, uh, you know, David David pointed to, you know, the, the cases that supported Roe and then the cases that came after Roe, um, you know, including uh, cases that uh, provide protection for same-sex marriage. I mean, I, I think everything's at risk right now. I think that the, you know, the basis for um, the decisions is on, you know, the, san you know, the sanctity of, of privacy that's um, been developed over, over many decades of case law and, and taking out uh, Roe versus Wade is is a huge um, it's a, it's a huge change that affects everything that came after it. Um, I would say in this particular realm. So I think that everything's at risk right now. That would be my view. Um, the one sort of um, and I apologize. There are some cars outside my window that are fighting with lots of honking. So if that if you hear that, I apologize. Um, but um, you know, one sort of bright spot there there have been some bright spots I, I don't I think that we should um, not ignore them um, one of the bright spots in the fall of Roe is that Congress took action to protect marriage equality not all the action that people that people like me wanted but Congress passed the respect for marriage act last year which um, says in statute, so it doesn't, you know, the Supreme Court can change the constitutional interpretation, but this statute will still be there. It says that if someone's married in one state, they're married in all states, and all states have to recognize it. Now, it didn't go so far as to say that every state has to, rec has to provide same-sex marriage licenses of their own, um, but if a same-sex couple is married in, say, New York, because of this federal law, no matter what the Supreme Court says about Obergefell in the future, um, they will have to be recognized as married everywhere. And this, that's a really important protection that I don't know if we would have gotten without Dobbs. Um, so that's a, that I'm glad Congress acted to do something in that regard, because you're, the, the, the basis of your question is absolutely right. It's the same as the contraception answer I gave. Justice Thomas said very clearly that we're coming for same-sex marriage and same-sex intimacy too. So because all of that's based on the same thing. And I don't think we're going to see, um, or sorry, what I think we're seeing rather than a direct attack on marriage um, is some states starting to say, we're just gonna tweak some of the rights of marriage for same-sex couples. So we're not gonna consider um, everyone a parent of the people you adopt, of the kids you adopt together, um, if you're a same-sex couple. Um, it's, you're gonna have to either jump through other hoops or there won't be any hoops for you to jump through, but we're just gonna treat you a little differently. Um, I haven't seen states yet saying we're gonna try and ban same-sex marriage and then posing that test case, but we have seen states trying to tweak the rights of marriage for same-sex couples. Um, and I would hope the Supreme Court wouldn't allow that, but it scares me. I would just add that, you know, I think that that's right to recognize that, you know, and that's the point in, in fact of, 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 of Dobbs in a way, like let the, let the states decide or let Congress decide. So it's great that that, that, that did happen, you know, nationally as a legislative, um, you know, a legislative matter. It, it's at risk. It could be at risk in another Congress, right? It's always that way in that it shouldn't stop us from trying to pass legislation to, 
the right to abortion or abortion care um, nationally, which, you know, is an effort that's happening, um, even though it's not meeting with success, not surprisingly. But it's just to say, you know, it, it is right, David, to, to like point out that there's, you know, some extra efforts that are being made legislatively that will hopefully address this and, and perhaps make it so that we don't need to have the Supreme Court's protection um, but it's 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 at risk, and I think we're not used to that. Like we've fought for these um, for, fought for these rights to be enshrined, and now we're losing that. So we have to go to the legislatures to 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 do what what we think is is right. 